Erev Tov Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, and tonight a prophetic broadcast of our, our message, and I know it's going to be a blessing to you. Also, just a, a friendly reminder to thank those of you that are supporting the work that we do here, and if you'd like to be a part of that work, we do need your continued support. At the end of the broadcast, IsraeliNewsLive.org, our website, or IsraelReturns.com will be posted and as well as a mailing address. Thank you so much. Let's get right into this message. Prophecy of the two witnesses everywhere in the Bible. That, friends, is an understatement. I mean, how many times we thought, okay, a Revelation 11, we know speaks about the two witnesses. Not too long ago, God revealed to me, well, I say not too long ago, a couple of years back, that, uh, you know, I revealed to you how that uh, Obadiah also speaks of the two witnesses where it speaks about the deliverers will come up upon Mount Zion and shall judge the Mount of Esau. And recently, God showed me that how that Mount Zion would actually become Mount Esau because the Jewish people are giving away the land to the Vatican itself. That's why he has to send the two witnesses, or deliverers in this case they're called, to the Mount Zion to deliver or to bring that judgment on Mount Esau. Obadiah, scriptures fulfilled everywhere. I mean, the Pope of Rome fulfilling Obadiah verse 16 about drinking upon his holy mountain in the masculine plural there, only to find out that the nations would continually drink and God would make them to swallow down. Prophecies left and right being fulfilled in the Holy Land of Israel today. And tonight, you're going to find out even deeper as we dug a little recently into Daniel 11, verse 44, and found out that out of the east and out of uh, the north, or the hidden Tzaphon, we find out that tidings come that cause that devil to go on a rampage to kill and confiscate as much as he possibly can. In fact, when I shared that with you there, I, I broke down the Hebrew words for you there. How that, uh, it says, Ushama'ot yabachaluhu, uh, which is uh, what he hears causes him a great panic, but he hears it from the east and from the north, or from what who comes from the east and from the hidden ones, the two witnesses there. Uh, in fact, when I was on John the Baptist, his program there, Rev uh, let's see, Tribulation Now believes the program, with John there, I brought this out, and John was blown away. He caught that revelation right off the bat. Not many people get it either, because it is deep there. But it says, uh, bachama, which is, and he will go out, or he leaves, he exits with rage, gadola, uh, bechama, gadola, with a great rage and fury. Why? Because Satan is thrown out of heaven. And then he comes down to do what? To destroy and to confiscate. Ula harim is to actually confiscate. It has nothing to do with just make away many, but he's confiscating what? The lands all around Israel. And we're seeing these things already in a preliminary stage, which you've seen nothing yet. Satan is about to be on a major campaign. Let's get right into this. I'm excited about it. Revelation 11. This is the main one we think of right here. The two witnesses. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God in the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, I have always stood by that applying to the Vatican being given the outside part because they tread down the holy city for forty and two months. But even deeper was when Pastor Paul Begley interviewed Rabbi Yehuda Glick and found out that between the third temple they're going to build beside the Dome of the Rock, in between the two, they're going to make a museum of all nations. Another biblical prophecy sign showing us right here in Revelation 11. Leave out that outer court. It's given to what? The Gentiles, the nations. All right. Then he says here, though, Revelation 11, 3. Now notice, I think that the building of the third temple, by the way, is about to happen 
and could even begin to break ground the end of this year, if not the first of next year. I'm telling you, friends, it's on our heels. Revelation 11:3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. They ain't going to be running around in gunny sacks, so don't get that idea. I've seen too many people come to Israel in gunny sacks thinking they're one of the two witnesses. No, it represents their humility. The sackcloth represents the mourning of Israel to, to comfort them that mourn. See, they're in sackcloth and ashes. But notice this, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. See, actually the word power is something that is added in there, but he says, I will give unto my witness, to my two witnesses. In other words, what is it? What's going on? Why is God giving something? Because they're already here. They're just not anointed yet for that particular job. This is why there is a gift that comes upon them. And I believe it's the spirit of Elijah and Moses that come upon two people anointed with that spirit there. These are the two olive trees, by the way, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And of course, it goes on to speaking about if any man tries to hurt them, fire proceeds from their mouth, not like a dragon. But remember Elijah, when the 50 soldiers were sent out to come get him, and he called God, he asked God, he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. And see, that's what, that's what it speaks about there. In other words, when someone's trying to kill him, God will do the work to take care of the problem. All right. Anyway, let's continue on right here. Rabbi Yehuda Glick in this picture here with Adnan and Akhtar, this is the coming third temple, which is a Turkish support. As we brought out in the news the other day, why you're seeing this sudden relationship between Israel and Turkey and even Russia, because they're all key players and to help bring about a third temple in Israel. So they've quickly pulled this together. Rabbi Glick, along with Adnan and Akhtar, have been pushing for the third temple. Uh, this was brought out by Brother Paul Begley, has stated that Rabbi Yudah Glick said that there would be a museum of all nations, just what we spoke about earlier. Another thing that I thought was interesting, though, too, the two olive trees. Now, by the way, they're in Jerusalem. There are two olive trees on the Mount of Olives there that have been dated by the, by the uh, university there uh, that the trees are, uh, are plus 2,000 years old over 2,000 years old, only two of them on the Mount of Olives. Now, in since in traveling throughout Israel, I have seen other trees, especially up near the Galilee, Nazareth area and stuff like that. Again, olive trees that no doubt are over 2,000 years old. I believe everywhere you see an olive tree like that, it was a place where Yeshua was praying. But anyway, Revelation 11:4. these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Zechariah 4.12 states, and I, I, and I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. I mean, you got to be kidding me. People are looking for somebody else other than Moses and Elijah to be to fulfill fulfillment of, of the prophecy of the, of the two witnesses when clearly God has said through the very prophet Zechariah or said to the prophet Zechariah, these be these two olive trees are the two that stand by the God of the whole earth. And you, unless you believe that Jesus or Yeshua Mashiach is not the God of the whole earth, if you think somebody else is the God of the whole earth, and yet we saw on Mount Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah standing there with Yeshua. And you mean to tell me there's some other guy going to be standing there instead? I mean, you saw that scripture being manifest right there in your own eyes from Zechariah when Yeshua was there on Mount Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah appeared unto him. And then afterwards, remember how he comes down and they ask him, they say, but doesn't the scribe say that Elias is supposed to forerun first, which is Elijah, Greek for Elijah? And Yeshua, what did he say? Truly. Elijah shall first come, and he will restore all things. But I say to you, he's already come. They did to him what was listed. See, Yeshua was showing a future coming, as well as John the Baptist, which, by the way, he was already dead when they asked him that. So how could he put it in the future unless Elijah was coming again? And, of course, John the Baptist was a good example of the spirit of Elijah on another person. So think about that, guys. Now, I'll show you another one about the two olive trees.
One maybe you never thought about. I never thought about of it until just recently. Take a look here on the screen behind you. This is Solomon's temple here, an image of it that's been put together. Now, I kind of stretched it a little bit to fit the screen so you could see it better. But when God commanded how the temple was to be built and Solomon built it, he built it as you come into the, as it's called, oracle or the sanctuary. He had, uh, now you, they cut it off here so you can see the inside view, but it's a folding olive door, two olive doors on either side of the entranceway, and then into the Holy of Holies again, two olive doors. What is it? It's the two olive trees. Who walked in between these doors right here on a regular basis when he was there in Jerusalem? It was none other than Yeshua, our own Lord, walking through those two olive doors, and it was the golden lampstand, the golden menorah, the tree of life, walking in between the two olive stands, or the two, two olive branches there, in other words. Another type of Moses and Elijah. Unbelievable. Now, guys, here's where it's going to get interesting. So, tighten up the seat belt. Hold on. We're going for a ride. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice. Together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Thy watchman. Do you realize that in Hebrew, the word watchman there, it's a fee, okay? It is, it is not the exact same root as tzifon, but it uses the first two letters, tzadife, okay? Tzifon is tzadife uh, vav nun, all right? And in the case of the word watchman, I believe I remember right, it's spelled tzadife yod, Okay, for the watchman, because it's plural in this case here. So you add the yod into there, but it's still very similar in the wording there. Thy watchman shall lift up the voice with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. Now the word actually is to shout out. They're going to shout out. But where are they doing it from? When the Lord shall bring against Zion, the watchman. Which watchman is he talking about? The two witnesses and you're about to find out how that works. Let's take a look here. Joel chapter 2 verse 1. Blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. It is for it is nigh at hand. Where? In Zion. Well, that's kind of interesting, guys, because guess what? It's the watchmen that are sounding out. Their voice is the trumpet. It even says in the Bible in another scripture, I didn't think to put it in there, but, but when God, when he, when he speaks, it's like a, is, is thundering. And then another place where when God comes out and speaks, the trumpets were blowing. Okay, so they're sounding out. They're, they're sounding out that alarm. Therefore also know, saith the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and with mourning. Why the morning? Because what happens in Zechariah 12 when they look upon him who was thrust through or who was pierced and they shall separate each one to their own family and they shall mourn as a family that lost their only son. What about Isaiah 61 where God commands those witnesses to comfort them that mourn in Zion? You're going to find out that it's the two witnesses in Isaiah 61. Okay, and rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Oh my gosh, Israel, this is your waking up time. See, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Okay, and by the way, in Hebrew, it's not the word meat, as you would think, it's food. Okay, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Notice that, blow the trumpet in Zion. Where? Zion, Mount Zion. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn, a solemn assembly together. All right, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children of those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom come forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen shall rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? So you want to know what you can do, my Christian brothers and sisters? That's your, that's your part right there. From 16 on down, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. You're supposed to be praying for Israel. See? 
And let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. That's dealing with Israel, but let me tell you something. I believe the Gentile has a, has a place in there just as much. All right, Joel 2.23. Let's start breaking this down now. All right, it says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately and will cause to come down. Uh, now we're into verse, verse 23, excuse me. He will, uh, oh, let, me, let me back up because I, I don't want to lose you here in what I'm doing here. I'm dropping down from verse 17. I want to give you a kind of setting the stage. In Joel chapter 2, the whole stage is the redemption of Israel. All right? Blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. Remember what happens in Obadiah? God's holy mountain in verse 17 of Obadiah chapter 1 is Mount Zion. God has to, let me, let me, all right, let me just read this to you guys. I, I don't want you to miss nothing. I've had so much I'm trying to put in here and I, and, and I don't want to confuse anybody. All right, remember verse 16 I said has been fulfilled by the Pope of Rome. Pope Francis, yes, you fulfilled prophecy. I, 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 you should be proud of yourself. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. So it's not a very good end either for you. Sorry. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. And there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Drop down verse 21, and saviors or deliverers shall come up on the Mount of Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. All right? Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. It perfectly lines up with Obadiah. All right? But there's somebody blowing that trumpet, and that's what you're going to find out in a few minutes, all right? So let's take a look now. So after we see that this is about the deliverance of Israel, they're about to get their ears or their eyes opened and their ears unplugged. Let's go to Joel 2, going down to verse 23. And then it says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now, they're leaving out something very important for you from the Hebrew language that they're not telling you. And I've got that written here. I've got it highlighted in blue right here on your screen so you can see it. I don't want you to miss what he says here. He says, Ki natan lachem. See, therefore, or because I will give to you, speaking about Israel, I will give to them et hamore. What? It doesn't say nothing about rain right there. Et hamore. The teaching. Okay, what kind of teaching? La decha. The righteous teaching. God is saying, I will give unto you the righteous teaching. And the rain will come down. What kind of rain? A teaching rain. See, okay, what does he say here? They are red, which means then to come down lachem to them, and will come down to them geshemore. What will come down to them? A teaching rain. And then he says, ooh, ma malakosh, which is, and, and it'll be a latter, a later one, bereshon, and the first. Why are they getting both first and latter rains that are teaching rains? Because you want to know why? Because what Moses brought originally, the people rejected. Ezekiel chapter 20. I believe, I'm going to take you to it. Gosh, like I said, guys, I didn't get everything put in here. But you're going to hear about it. All right? You're going to hear about it today. Because we're not playing church, guys. And I, and I thank God for you. Because most of the ones that listen, you're, you're not the kind that plays church either. And thank God for it. All right? Let's take you right on down here. Let's go to verse... 25, I think it's chapter 20, verse 25. Let me just make sure that is right. Yes, it's got to be right. Wherefore, I've gave them also statues that, that were not... Okay, back up a little bit. Verse 22. Nevertheless, I withdraw mine hand 
and wrought for my name's sake, and it should not be polluted for the sight of the heathen in whose sight I brought them forth. I lifted up my hand unto them also in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the heathen and disperse them through the countries because they had not executed my judgments but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths and their eyes were after their father's idols. Wherefore I gave them all also statutes that were not good, judgments whereby they should not live. And I polluted them in their own gifts, and they, and they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb, that I might make them desolate to the end, that they might know that I am the Lord. Okay, now you can back up even further, uh, like verse 19, I am the Lord your God, w walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, and you, shall, and you may know that I am the Lord your God, notwithstanding the children rebelled against me, verse 21, and walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall live in them, they polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. You see, what was it? God gave on, from Mount Horeb, he gave Moses t ten commandments and two statutes. And the Bible said, I believe it's in the book of Numbers, and he added no more. And he wanted them to keep these, but they would not keep it. So God did give a Levitical law. He did permit these things. He began, he speaks about, and they would, and I polluted them in their own gifts in that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb. Okay, that was the sacrificial law. He allowed it. Okay, in other words, he's going to show you, all right? You, I'll give you one you can't keep. So what is it? They're getting a teaching reign. Ki natan lachem er hamora latzedecha veyored lachem geshem more u melakosh bereshon. Okay, I will give unto you the teach, the righteous teaching. I will bring down to you Geshem I will bring down to you the teaching rain from the last and the first. Because why? Israel still, Israel is so stuck in the laws. Remember God said, I will write the laws upon their hearts, on the tables of their hearts. You know, God's word is not hard to keep, friends. Look over in the book of Revelation even. Those that, have, that, that keep his commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what it says, Yeshua HaMashiach. God's not trying to get you to keep all of the 613 Levitical laws. He's only wanting you to keep his commandments that he gave through his prophet Moses. So this is what's going to happen. He's taking them back to the basics. All right, this is what God is doing here in Joel 2, 2.23. It just says, For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Never seen anything about the word teaching, did it? It did not have not one bit about et ha more. Do you realize that et there? Et is not a translated word. It is, a, it, is, uh, it is to make that a direct object. It is specifically telling you what kind of rain this is. And they just kind of blow over it in the English language like it meant nothing. It means a lot, friends. It means a whole lot. All right, let's take a look at more, though. You want to see about where that former rain's prophesied at? It's all through the Bible. It's just, I'm just going to give you one. Hosea, let's start with chapter 5, verse 5. And I will go. This is God speaking to the prophet Hosea to the children of Israel. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction they will seek me early yes they started when the holocaust hit that's when our families really begin to start seeking god and wanting to go back to the homeland i can say that you have to understand i have family both sides my father the benun which if you look at my dna on my father's side where benun dinun Levi, uh, uh, Werner, Turner, all the Jewish names there, all associated with my father. My mother's the same way. Coleman, Ziegler, Heinrich, all these are, my mother's side did not even intermarry inside the Gentile faith. My father's side did right before I was born. Okay? 
But look at here. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up after two days. Will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Do you realize this? Hosea prophesied this almost 700 years before Yeshua. And he said in the third day. Friends, we're in that third day. 2,700 plus years later. Then shall we know if we follow to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall what? Come unto us as the rain, and as the latter and former rain unto the earth. And what rain is that going to be? Well, it's going to be Joel 2.23, 2, that teaching rain that's about to strike the earth. But it's a restoration rain. It's a rain that brings back what was taught by Moses originally, that's why God sends Moses and Elijah. Do you remember Malachi 4? Let me, let me. I wish my wife would let me bring one of her revelations out, but she's going to bring it out to you herself. And it is a power punch. It's right out of Malachi's prophecy. And I, I never caught it. I never caught it, but she got it. And it is incredible. Write her a letter. Tell her, say, Sister Yana, please give us that revelation. <laughs> she's she's holding back so uh, actually it's kind of my fault as well I've got to make something for it in order for us to give you a visual on this anyway for behold the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud yea all that do wickedly shall be stubble the day that cometh shall burn them up saith the Lord of hosts that shall leave them neither root nor branch but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall that's Yeshua friends I know it's S-U-N but you'll find out Ask Yana to do the video. You'll find out what that is. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes as under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord. Now watch this. Remember ye... Here's what's weird. He's, he's going to talk about Elijah, but, what, but he throws Moses in here. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Go to Mount Horeb. Look it up in your Bible. Look up the statutes. Moses, Mount Horeb. You won't find anything else but the Ten Commandments and the two statutes. That's it. And God said, remember Moses, my servant, what I commanded him on Mount Horeb. All right, that's the only ones that he wants you to remember. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So not only you got to remember the words of Moses, but also Elijah. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, John the Baptist, Yeshua applies part of that verse to John. Yeshua said that John... He turned the children of the, or excuse me, the heart of the fathers to the children. The heart of the fathers, friends, was to was the longing for the coming of the Mashiach, the Messiah. That was their desire. And John, as Elijah, gave Israel the heart of their fathers, but they didn't receive it because it wasn't in their heart. You understand? But this time around, this spirit of Elijah with Moses is going to do what? He is going to take the children, uh, the, the, uh, he's going to do it the other way around, and the heart of the children to their fathers. The fathers long to see the Messiah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, they long to see the Messiah. They would have believed him when he came. That was, the, that was Elijah turning the heart of the fathers to the children. The children weren't ready. But in this day, the children are ready for the Messiah, and Elijah will turn them to who the Messiah really is. Praise be to God, friends. I'm, I'm fired up tonight, boy. Oh, gosh. The divine name, Joel 2.32, again. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now notice that. See right there. Call on the name. They're going to say, 
that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, where is this happening at in Mount Zion? When this great victory is coming for Israel, they're going to call on the name of the Lord. Now, how are they going to do it if they don't know the name? Watch Zephaniah 3, 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. That's not pray like pray for help and God and stuff like that. He's coming to do judgment. All right? Now, but God tells you to wait upon Him. So why do people try to say God's divine name when you don't even know it? You sit there, you go, you go with Yahweh, Jehovah, Yehovah, Yahuwah, and everything else, and God's already told you, wait you upon me saith his divine name, yod heh until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the, the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9, For then will I turn to the people of pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord. When, when, when he's gathered the nations there, when he's ready to, ready to bring upon his judgment, how does he bring his judgment out? How does God bring upon his judgment in the land? Just like he did with Moses and, Moses and Aaron. What did he say to Moses? He, said, he tells Moses, I have come down and I am uh, to deliver my people. And, and, I, and God uses the personal pronoun everywhere, everywhere. I have done this and I have done that. And then he says to Moses, and I'm sending you. God is bringing his judgment, his plagues upon the earth. Remember at Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people, lest you be partakers of her sins and her plagues. I'm just paraphrasing. Come out of the Catholic Church. Come out of the denominational systems that support the Catholic Church or God's going to bring down that judgment through those two witnesses. All right? So it's this is when this is happening. He says, For then I will turn to the people of pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve Him with one consent. I believe Moses will reveal that when he's here as one of the two witnesses. We'll go into that in a little bit. Anyway, Isaiah 52. I started that off a little bit ago. I brought you out Isaiah 52, and I want to bring that back up to you. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, uh, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised or unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Daughter of Zion, that's the future generation. That's today's generation. She's captive. All right? For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught. You sold your own selves this time. And you shall be redeemed without money. Just like the story of Joseph. You know, it's kind of funny. The Pope brings that up. I, he makes himself like he's Joseph. Okay. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime in Egypt to sojourn there, and the Syrian oppressed them without cause. Now, therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught, that they rule over them, make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. You know why? It's because according to Daniel 11, another scripture I didn't put in, all right, Daniel chapter 11, and you know, these are scriptures that are supposed to be sealed up to the end of days, but you know, we are living in the last days. So maybe that's why God is making some of these actually known to you today. All right? So it says right there, and God, for, understand, my brothers and sisters, I'm nobody. All right? I'm nobody. But for some reason, He just lets me see things, and I don't know why, but He does. Okay? Therefore, my people shall know my name. Wait a minute. Back up. Now, therefore, what have I, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for not for they that rule over them? To how, saith the Lord, in my name continually every day is blasphemy. Therefore, my people shall know my name. They shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Wow. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Anyway, Daniel 11. 
I want to show you why, they, why they're sold for not. It's right here, verse 14, 11, 14, and those times here shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the, the robbers of, my, of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. That's actually the sons of your people, the angel speaking to Daniel, the Jews, the sons of the lawless of your people shall try to marry the vision. That's what it really says in Hebrew. And that's what Shimon Perez and Ariel Sharon did. They sold out Israel for nothing. For what? What did the Jews get for it? They were sold out for nothing. The Vatican got control and they put a yoke around Israel's neck. And you don't even have to do it. My God. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, and bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Ooh, we're going to get a good one there, aren't we? Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing, and they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. You got your two witnesses right here, guys. We're going to break it down. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Now, Israel, no doubt, has sold out Jerusalem to the Vatican. That's the name of the article uh, delivered by News That Matters. Got their website on the screen for you there. Again, I'm using the scripture 52.2. O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Now notice what it says in the op-ed, exclusive, a seat for the Pope at King David's tomb. The Israeli authorities have granted the Pope an official seat in the room where the Last Supper is believed to have taken place on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where David and Solomon, Jewish kings of Judea, are considered by some researchers to be buried. Where? Mount Zion. It is the culmination of a long campaign by the Catholic Church to regain religious stewardship over the place where Jesus is supposed to have broken bread and drunk wine with his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. This is an enormous issue published throughout without any public debate. No wonder why it says in Obadiah, the deliverers come up on Mount Zion. See? Because Mount Zion had become the Mount of Esau. It became the Mount of Esau when they give the Pope an official seat there. That's when it became that. Now, look at verse 3 of Isaiah 52. You have sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. Genesis 43, 18. Remember the story of Joseph? And the men were afraid because they were brought unto Joseph's house, and they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time are we brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us. See, this reason why he's saying you were... You are sold, you sold, you have sold yourselves for nothing. This is why you see in the story of Joseph that he puts the money back in their bags. It's only a type, guys, just laying in there. Verse 5, dropping down to verse 5 in Isaiah 52. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. In one of the lost gospels, it says that in the age that it is to come, that his name would be blasphemed more than any other time. Zephaniah 3 9. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent, right? I already brought that out. The two witnesses will restore that as from what I can see. Notice Isaiah 52, verse 6. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. It's perfectly in line with Zephaniah's prophecy. It's perfectly in line. Let me, let me back up just a little bit here. All right. Um... It's perfectly in line with Joel 2.32, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Joel is setting the stage for a future redemption, friends. All right? 
And then we find it also in Isaiah 52, 6. It's, it all comes down on Mount Zion. God's name is going to be revealed in a solemn assembly on Mount Zion. Okay? Therefore, my people shall know my name. Watch what it says in Hebrew. All right? Let me take you to the board here so you can see it. Lachen, therefore, yodea ami, know my people. Ami is, am is, my, is people. Ami is my people. In other words, therefore, my people will know. We have to just uh, assume the word is will is in there. Will know shmi, my name. Shem is name. And the, the yod at the end here represents my, shmi, my name. Therefore, my people will know my name. Lechem beyom chahu ki ani hu hamedaber hineni. Right there. I am he that doth speak. See? Ki ani. Behold, I who hamedaber. Who? I, he is. Dead on it. I am the one. He's going to reveal his name. So that time is coming. How do we know this? So Exodus chapter 3 verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. They shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Okay. Uh, Yod Gimel, that's verse 13. Yod Dalet, verse 14. Ve'yomer Moshe el ha'elohim hine anochiba el b'nei Yisrael. Okay, all right. And, and says Moses to God, Behold, anochiba el b'nei Yisrael, I will come unto the children of Israel. Ve'amati lahem elohai avotechem shelechani elechem. And I will say to them that the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. Right? All right? And then he says, They will say to me, Mashimo. What is his name? Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. Mashimo. Shemo. And now we have Shmi. Shemo would be a vav, a longer stick right there, would mean his name. Or what is his name? In this case here he says, Lachen yadea ami. Shmi, and they will know my name. All right, how are they going to know his name? Right there, just like he says, Ve amru li ma shemo, ma omer elham. What do I say to them? Your dalit, verse fourteen. Ve yomer elahim el Moshe i haye asha i haye ve yomer ko ta amar levne Yisrael i haye shalachani aleyachem. But they're going to get the divine name that everybody seems to think they know, but they don't know. That's going to change. Isaiah 52, verse 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring good tidings. There again, remember about God coming to Moses? I have called you. I am sending. Or, you know, I will deliver my people. It's I, I, I. And then God says, and I'm sending you. We see the same thing in verse 7 and 8. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Whoa. Mm. All right, I have it later in this, but I've got to bring it out to you now. Let's take a quick look at Isaiah 61. All right? Because you're watching Isaiah 52, 7, but all along you don't even realize this is Isaiah 61. But Isaiah 61, Yeshua only reads half of the verse and then puts down the scroll and leaves out the other part. Now we can understand why. All right? He says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath Excuse me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, and he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, what is it here? Good tidings of good that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Now that's not what it says in Isaiah 61. But we do find out, though, according to the scriptures and what we're seeing now, when it says the next part of Isaiah 61, verse 2, 
the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise. He fulfills, thy God reigneth, Revelation 12. Remember what we did the other day with Daniel 11, 44? And we looked at Revelation 12. All right? So, the feet that are beautiful, this is Yeshua, that bringeth good tidings of good. But then he's using a mouthpiece. Verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. That's your two witnesses. And they see eye to eye. Isn't that interesting? And by the way, the sing is shout. They shout it out. What are they shouting out? They're shouting out the good tidings. They're publishing the salvation unto Zion that thy God reigneth. All right, again, let's go back to Revelation chapter 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Thy God reigneth. But the ones that are crying it out are the watchmen. The two witnesses are crying it out. Remember Daniel 11, though? I said they heard from the north, the hidden ones in the east. All right, let's watch it now. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and of the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come unto you having great wrath because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Right? Now, notice this here. Again, Revelation 12, verses 10 to 12. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come the salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Right? For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. That's Revelation, right? Deuteronomy 11, 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Now, I didn't put it on the screen for you this time, but I'll again give you that literal breakdown of that. Ushema'ot yabachaluhu. All right? And he hears. He hears something that causes him great panic. And it says from mimazarach u mitzifon. See, from the east and the hidden or the north. See, what is it? He's hearing from Christ. He hears from, he's, and, and not to mention, the devil himself, be bechema. He has to go out with great rage, gedola, see, to destroy lechashemit u lachacharim to confiscate much rabim. This is what it really says there. He hears, Satan is hearing because he's over there in heaven. But remember, he's cast out. Before he gets cast out, he finds out that the kingdom is given over unto. It's now, God is now reigning. And what happens in heaven is going to manifest on earth. And what happens? He hears it there. So the, the, they come down. And that's what we're seeing, friends, right over here in Isaiah. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord uh, shall bring again Zion. But what are, they, what are they calling out? They're calling out the very message that Yeshua wanted to bring out. Thy God reigneth. I know it's a little confusing, and I know it's not easy to catch at, but watch it. Now notice also Isaiah 52, 8, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. It's all tied up in there, the two witnesses the whole time. Revelation 12, 13, and when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which was, that brought forth the man-child. That's Israel. They brought forth Yeshua. Our Jesus the, the Savior. And the woman were given to two wings of a great eagle. There's your two witnesses again. That she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time's time and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Oh my gosh, friends, she's nourished. And by the way, that nourishment is spiritual. And we talked about the Former and latter rain, the teaching rain. 
the two wings of a great eagle are your two prophets that come down with the, with the former and la with the former teaching and the latter teaching rain. Restoring the word of God back. How do we know it's the two witnesses? Exodus 19, 4, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. And do you realize that when a lot of these scriptures I'm reading about Mount Zion, like over in uh, Joel and stuff, goes back and refers to when they were down in bondage in Egypt? Moses and Aaron brings them out. That was the eagle wings that they were carried out on. Jeez, friends. Isaiah 31. Let me share another one with you. This one's going to be really good because you're going to see where one of these scriptures has already been fulfilled. So it's going to tell you how close you are to the fulfillment of the Zion showdown. All right. For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice nor abase himself for the noise of them, so shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. Again, Mount Zion. And what is it? A whole host of shepherds is called forth against him. The Vatican has been calling all of the ministers of the world, the Kenneth Copelands and all the evangelicals and everybody together to come against God on Mount Zion. You think God's going to bow down to that devil? He ain't going to bow down for no devil. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defend also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. Turn you unto him from whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. For in that day every man shall cast away his idols of silver and his uh, idols of gold, which your own hands have made unto you for a sin. See, Israel's still revolting. And now you've got a huge group of shepherds that have turned against the Lord. Every minister that joins the Vatican is turned against God. Every one of them. Then, verse 8, chapter 31. This is what's happening here in modern days. Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword. Now remember, the Assyrian is modern day Syria and northwest Iraq. Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword, not of a mighty man, and the sword, not of a mean man, shall devour him. He shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be discomfited. Because the United States created a civil war, his own friends, his own brothers, not a mighty man. An internal revolt. They have sent the Syrian and the Iraqi refugees all over the world. Again, another scripture that shows it, besides the ones I've already showed you. Verse 9, And he shall pass over to his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign, saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? His fire is in Zion. Remember Revelation 11? Fire proceeds from their mouth if anyone tries to hurt them. Hmm. Now let's look at Isaiah 61. We saw the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me as Yeshua read this scripture. That's him, both verse 1 and verse 2, but only half of verse 2 has not been fulfilled. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. That's Zechariah 12, by the way, to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. Why Zion? There's going to be a solemn assembly sanctify a fast and a solemn assembly on Mount Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified remember the teaching rain it's sedacha. It's a righteous teaching. And who is that teaching being done by? The two olive trees. The two olive trees are planting more olive trees. Remember how Paul over in, uh, uh, what is it? Um, I think it's Romans 11. He speaks about those olive branches. Isn't that right? 
He tells the Gentiles, don't be lifted up. Right? Verse 11, say that have stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation has come into the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles insomuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciliation of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Hmm. For if the first fruit um, be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou steadfast uh, standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity toward the goodness of them that continue in goodness. Otherwise thou also should be cut off, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert, wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own tree? Okay, now watch this. Go down to verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Again, Mount Zion is the place of the showdown, friends. Zechariah 12, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon uh, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one for his only son. If you're a Jewish brother, listen to this. Let me tell you something, my brother. You can use the word thrust through all you want because the Roman soldiers thrust him through, but he's holding Israel accountable because it was our rabbis that handed him over. We got to bear, we got to bear the consequences, okay? That's why Joseph put the cup into Benjamin's bag. Benjamin was not guilty of selling him out, but the cup was placed in his bag. Why? Twofold reason. One, because the Jews of today are not guilty of what happened to Yeshua. In some ways, you think that anyway. That's actually a lot deeper teaching than what you could ever even imagine. But anyway, he, he does go on, and he simply says this here, that that with Benjamin, he puts that cup there because why? God also knew that the Benjamites would call for his blood years later. And it also represents the fact that Benjamin is still, even though he didn't hand over his brothers, he's still, the cup is found in his bag. It was a prophetic insight of a future event, speaking of today, that we would have to face up with what happened to Yeshua. All right, now, Verse 11, and that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadramon in the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, and the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart. It breaks it all the way down. You get all the way down to verse 14. It's dealing with all, it's the tribes of Judah. David and Nathan are from the house of Judah, are from the tribe of Judah. It's the house of Judah, I should say. But they're from the tribe of Judah. Levi is his own tribe. Shemai, as it's mentioned, the family of Shemai apart and their wives apart is the Benjamites. Just like we saw in the story of David. It was Shemai that spit on David and cursed him and everything else. But when David was returning, it was Shemai that met him at the river. Right? The Benjamite. That's why Benjamin has the cup in his bag. His descendants are the ones that were part of this. And all the families that remain. That is the, those, the families that have remained that have to go through this are the Samaritans. 
half Jew, half Gentile that remained in the land to this day. Anyway, I know it's been a lot, guys. Long message. And again, we thank you for watching. We need your prayers more than anything else. We covet your prayers. And this hour that we're living in, it is a very serious one. And your help in making this message continue forward and getting this message out to the world, we need your help in that as well. So stand with us in your support. We need your financial help. IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com. And of course, at the end of the broadcast, our mailing address here in the Czech Republic. Shalom and God bless you.